Mark Kine, founder of Disaster Doc here. We're going to look at today at earthquakes, module number five. So our learning objectives, let's go through these together. After completing this lesson, students will be able to define the term earthquake, recognize the basic elements of plate tectonics, recognize the difference between a Richter scale and a Mercalli scale for measuring earthquake severity. Also list the secondary disasters that may occur as a result of earthquakes and identify human factors that can contribute to the severity of impact from earthquakes. We're also going to recognize that earthquakes typically have high death tolls and we'll identify the major health consequences of earthquakes. We'll recognize that earthquakes related health effects occur in two main stages. We'll also list the secondary disasters that may occur as a result of earthquakes and then finally we'll identify those measures that lessen the health impact of earthquake disasters. So what is an earthquake? I'll give you a definition so that we're all on the same page together. It's a violent shaking of the Earth's crust that results from a sudden release of energy along a fault line. And we'll talk more about that fault line as well. Or sometimes earthquakes can actually result from volcanic activity. So we're going to get into a little bit of basic elements of plate tectonics. I'm going to teach you some new stuff. If you haven't already heard about plate tectonics, now you're going to have a whole new vocabulary for the party this weekend. You'll be the life of the party when you walk in and talk about plate tectonics, right? So anyway, but it's important stuff to kind of understand about this, these plates because it really does uh, let us uh, be able to predict where these things will occur. So the Earth's surface, and many of you already know this, but kind of a review for you, the Earth's surface is a, covered with a series of plates that all move against each other. And they actually do move from time to time. And some of these plates, actually, the one in California moves at the same speed that your fingernails grow. So of course you can't see them moving, but they're moving all the time. And over a week or two, you can notice that that movement has occurred, and that's what's happening with these plates as well. They move in relation to sh uh, each other. Some of them actually move, move apart. We call that a rift, and some of them move together. So that's a subduction, when one goes under the other. And so they can move also side to side as well. So you have this sort of side to side movement um, as well. And it's this movement at these junctions of these plates where you really have this earthquake activity. What we're experiencing is the rapid slips of these plates, whether slipping under or slipping next to each other. And that's what causes an earthquake. And we can measure earthquake severity by these different scales. And if you've heard about earthquakes in the past, you've probably heard the Richter scale. That's the most common. And you hear people talk about that the most commonly. But there's a little bit of difference between this Richter scale and another scale that gives us a little bit better idea of how much ground movement. And that scale is called the Mercalli scale. So I'm going to separate those out and kind of dig down for you a little bit about what that really means. So a Richter scale measures the amount of energy released in an earthquake. And now it's been uh, replaced by what's called a moment magnitude scale, or an MMS, but a very similar idea. And the Richter scale has levels of 1 to 10. Um, it's usually represented in Arabic numerals. And each level is 10 times stronger than the previous level. So, you know, a 1 is not just, or excuse me, a 2 is not just uh, twice as strong as a 1. It's actually 10 times stronger than a 1. And a three is a hundred times stronger than a one, and a four is a thousand times stronger than a one. So when you hear something going between an eight and a nine, you're talking about a big earthquake at an eight level that as a nine is now ten times stronger. So we're really talking about a big difference. And what's that scale? You know, how does that make a difference? Well, let me give you an example of that. If you have a marble, just a little small uh, marble, you know, like children play with and you take the next step of size, the next step from a one, uh, the marbles of the one to the two, is actually about the size of a golf ball. But if you take a step from a two to a three, then that's about the size of a grapefruit. And three to four is about the size of a basketball. So you can see the difference between a marble and a basketball, uh, difference between one and four, quite a bit of difference. Now if you go up to a 10, now you're talking about a, a, a earthquake in comparison to that marble, the size of a large hot air balloon. So it's a lot of difference in this scale of the, of the Richter scale. And it's appropriate for measuring the energy, but it's not that accurate when we're talking about the ground movement up above the Earth. And so let's look at another scale of severity, the Mercalli scale, and we'll talk more about that. A little bit easier for us to use because then we can talk about the movement on top of the Earth, and that's what affects us, right? So this Mercalli scale, it's called the Modified Mercalli Intensity Scale, or Mercalli Scale. And it measures the amount of ground motion, which is different than energy. You can have a lot of energy re uh, released in a certain area, but not much ground motion on the top. 
or you can have a small amount and because of the soil makeup and the, and the makeup of the rock and so on in the earth itself, you have a lot more ground motion. So the Mercalli scale really gives us a better indicator of how much things move around on top and why is that important? Well, let's say, for example, that we have a soil that's relatively loose, and so an earthquake occurs down here in the bottom area, and uh, it makes the earth move down here, and it moves a little bit. If that soil is loose, like, for example, um, alluvial soil, which is uh, fallen into the area and filled into the area, and the soil is relatively loose, when there's a small amount of movement at the top, we have a larger amount of movement here uh, on the surface. So you have a small amount of earthquake movement and a large amount of surface movement uh, because it kind of acts like a whip. If it's more solid, then you have a small amount of movement, as you can see, small amount of movement up on the surface. But uh, once again, depending upon that area of movement in the ground. So that's why we want to use the Mercalli scale because if we're up on top of the ground, of course, that's what is important to us. And the Mercalli scale, actually a little different, it is a scale from 1 to 12, whereas the Richter was 1 to 10. And also, just to try to separate those, we use Roman numerals for the Mercalli scale, 1 to 12 in Roman numerals. That gives us a better idea of what the movement is. So sometimes people may hear, oh, that was an 8 Richter, or a 9 Richter. Why was that so uh, much better or uh, you know, not as severe as these others? It's because the Richter's me measuring energy, the amount of actual energy release, Mercalli scales measuring ground movement. That's the one we want to pay attention to. So I want to talk a little bit about this tsunami risk as well in the Pacific when we're talking about these types of, of phenomenon that occur. And you know, one of the reasons why we have that kind of risk uh, in the Pacific Ocean is because we have what's called a ring of fire. And what ends up happening is we have a Pacific plate dead center. You can see in this particular figure, dead center in the middle is that Pacific plate. Covers most of the Pacific Ocean. And on the borders actually is California, Oregon, up in Alaska, the Aleut Aleutian Islands are there as well. And then it comes down very near Japan. And of course, that's the plate where the Japanese earthquake occurred. And also, uh, we've seen many other earthquakes occur around the world as relation to this particular plate. So this circle, this Pacific plate is very very, very active on both sides, over on the side of Asia as well as on the side of the United States. And when that plate interacts, it of course has this huge body of water. So an earthquake on one side or the other can create a tsunami risk that goes all the way across the Pacific. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about tsunamis in the future. So let me get back to this earthquake disasters because it's very important for us to recognize. And I want to want you folks to recognize it as well that here in the United States, we have about 28 million people that are at risk for severe injury because of uh, earthquakes uh, movement in the United States. We have a few different zones out in South Carolina, New York. There's a big one in the central United States called the New Madrid Earthquake Zone or New Madrid Seismic Zone. And then, of course, we have the earthquake activity on the West Coast as well. Although most people, when you think, when you would ask them, most Americans, when you ask them, where's the earthquake uh, activity in the United States, most of them would point to California. But that's not necessarily the case. We have a lot of people at risk for earthquakes around the different areas of the United States. And so we had to think about this a lot when we're talking about, uh, you know, 28 million people being at risk. And also, too, the reason why is because these earthquake disasters typically have high death tolls. And if that's the case, of course, then we don't want a high death toll in a very um, well-populated area, a highly populated area. Unfortunately, what we've done is we've built a few large cities in these areas, and they've grown over the years and so on in the United States. And now we do have a large population centers um, in high uh, earthquake uh, uh, intensity activity. Um, for example, Los Angeles and San Francisco, St. Louis, Memphis, other areas around the world as well, or around the world also affected as by this uh, type of intensity as well. We see that um, in different areas of China, of course, in Japan, um, in many areas in the Middle East. Uh, we see it in Turkey, for example, in the Mediterranean, um, Iran, also very uh, high earthquake activity. Um, but what we have to recognize, typically high death tolls. And so, for example, between 1995 and 2015, um, 20 year period, three quarters of a million people died in about 500 earthquake related activities. So these earthquakes are not to be trifled with. They really are serious stuff when they occur. 
And you know, now we'll look at these natural disasters ranked by lives loss and worldwide looking at a 50 year period and earthquakes were actually number four, number five, and number six for the total number of lives lost. And those three earthquakes, for example, one in China, one in Indonesia, and one in Haiti, as we mentioned the, uh, in previous uh, presentations, that those together created nearly 800,000 deaths in only these three earthquakes. Um, and these were the, like I said, number four, number five, and number six for the most lives lost during this 50 year period due to natural disasters. So once again, let's take a, a little bit closer look at earthquakes because you know some of us have some good ideas of, of how people are killed in earthquakes, of course. You know, the saying, as I've always said, is that earthquakes don't kill people, buildings kill people. And for the most part, we actually see that phenomenon play out in different areas of the world. For example, you know, in, in many cases, actually males and females, depending upon where you are, what society you are, what you do for a living, makes a difference in what the risk is. For example, when we're talking about people who work in buildings, uh, high rises, uh, brick factories and so on, when the men uh, traditionally in, in years past would go into these factories and the women would stay home in wooden structures, one story homes or one story village uh, 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 homes and so on, um, actually the men would be, have more injuries because these bricks tend to fall. The, the buildings fail because of the earthquake and they fall and the men get injured, whereas the women and the children that are still in the home, um, in those cases they wouldn't be injured. Um, on the opposite though, if you're in a society that has a lot of farming or a part of the world that, um, or the country that has a lot of farming, the men may be out in the fields, no buildings at all, women back home, women tend to be more injured or it may be vice versa, the women are in the field and the men are back home inside buildings or other workplaces. And so we have this change in earthquake uh, related injuries, this pattern. So keep in mind traumatic injuries. When you think about where you're going to live, when you think about choosing your home and choosing your uh, work and so on, and, and you as, as executives and businessmen and so on, you start thinking about how can I keep my employees safe? How can I keep my business in, uh, in, uh, continuous and, and not, inter uh, not interrupted by these types of earthquakes? We have to think about the buildings where we are. Those are the big risks. And over time, of course, many areas of the world, including some, many of the major cities, and LA is a good example of the work that's being done in the United States, where the buildings are retrofitted, new buildings have codes and, regu and land use regulation to where the buildings are safer as time goes by. So we can make these uh, injuries uh, uh, much less common by simply being able to build things to where they will last. Um, but the thing that about these disaster related uh, injuries and causes of death related to earthquakes is that it also has a secondary component as well that most people don't know about and but it's still related to the building let's say for example I'm in a building and um, you know part of the ceiling falls or the walls fall and it, it impinges me and maybe I may not necessarily um, have you know uh, severe injuries to begin with but I'm trapped inside the building or I'm uh, entrapped where I can't get out that's one of the biggest risk factors um, for people passing away and losing their life is this uh, entrapment. We find that actually when people are entrapped inside of a building that they have about an average 36 hours um, to be released from this and after that the death rate goes up remarkably. So you can imagine this narrow window, 36 hours of the event, we're really only talking about a day and a half that you have to be able to be rescued. But the thing is is that it takes a while to get rescue teams to people. You know, the average uh, implementation of a rescue team where, you know, they get called from home, they go to the airport, they hop on a plane, they get all their equipment, all this equipment gets unloaded and everything, and then they start searching for people. It's, it's, it, it's, it's a very noble profession. They do great work, but also, as you can imagine, time is against them. So 36 hours, after 36 hours, we see people's uh, death rates go up. Why? Well, number one, they may not be able to get access to water during that 36 hour period. A typical person can only live about three days uh, if there's nothing else going on. The other thing about entrapment is, for example, if uh, the earthquake has occurred during winter time, people are exposed to cold um, while they're entrapped in these areas and they can succumb to that as well. So the other phenomenon that we see with these earthquake related injuries and, and deaths are this uh, phenomenon of asphyxia, this suffocation. And what ends up happening here is people are entrapped and then their chest is compressed. So as they take a deep breath, uh, they are unable to compress, they're unable to press against all, all of this weight. And when they let the breath out, the weight presses against them and now they can't draw that breath again. And each time we do that, of course, uh, letting the air out further, further compression, and after a while the breathing is compromised. 
So it's a very, very challenging element to really get people out of these buildings. And so we have to think in terms of safe buildings, right? Building codes, long-term uh, processes that save people's lives more than the idea that we're relying upon rescue. And if you know my book, you know, Too Little Too Late, Why We Can't Rely on Rescue, that's why I'm here with you. I want you to save your family's life. I want you to make good decisions for your business. I want you to make good decisions in the future so that we lower this risk as time goes by. So I'm not saying move out of your home right now. I'm not saying uh, you, know, you have to uh, quit your job immediately. We think in these long-term decisions when we have the ability to be able to build a safe building, choose a safe place to live, um, finding out what kind of buildings codes in these areas, we have to think in the long term. Safe hospitals, safe schools, that's what we need to do. Think about the future and not pass that risk on to future generations. So there are two main phases of the health impacts of earthquakes. One is immediate and one are delayed. And I wanna talk about those as well because it'll give you a better idea as well of when these injuries and illnesses occur and also how we can prevent those as well. So immediate impacts, as I mentioned, happen at the time of the earthquake or within a very few minutes. So that means there's a large number of people that when the earthquake happens, large number of people die right away or they get injured right away in very severe ways. And then there are these delayed impacts that take longer and they may develop over hours, sometimes days, and sometimes even weeks or months following the actual earthquake, the shaking stop, but we start getting these secondary and delayed impacts, health effects that occur in the second wave. So I want you to remember that because that's important. Just because people survive that first immediate impact, there's still danger out there. We need to be thinking about that second wave of, of illness and injury. So these immediate effects, what are they? You know, we'll talk about this because some of them are intuitive and some of them aren't. So I wanna kind of go through them one by one and give you a better idea once again so you can protect yourself, protect your family, protect your employees as well. So first off is, you know, minor injuries. We see that a lot. We see more minor injuries, of course, in an earthquake than we would see severe injuries, as you would expect. A lot more people have injuries, period. We also see lacerations or cuts and, and bruises and things like that where broken glass, things sharp that fall and so on. And so we see cuts in large numbers with pa uh, patients as well. In addition, we see what's called a crush injury and these happen to the head or the chest. If those happen to the head, a crush injury to the head, crush injury to the chest, most of those people succumb uh, and, and, and die um, as a result of the earthquake within minutes, within hours. So most of those folks um, unfortunately uh, pass away very quickly. We also see this phenomenon of hemorrhage. So this is severe bleeding that occurs. So you get a cut as a result of one of these lacerations and people just literally bleed to death in a very short period of time as a result of this. Or, as I mentioned, suffocation, where people may uh, be their chest compressed, not be able to take a deep breath, um, or not be able to get adequate air. There are also other things that are a little bit counterintuitive though. One of the other uh, health impacts of earthquakes is drowning. Well, certainly, of course, if the earthquake is associated with a tsunami, you would see that as well. But in some cases, for example, people may be in the basement and there may be an entrapment that occurs. They can't get out. They may be lying flat on the floor in the basement. And then now you have water coming in from the broken water mains that are occurring. Or people may be trapped wherever it is and maybe 12, 18, 20 inches of water um, is too high for them to be able to come above. And because of their um, entrapment, um, they end up drowning as a result of that. So you do see that from time to time. Not a very common occurrence, but it's one of those things that do happen. The other things that we see in the immediate effect are burns. Um, so for, for example, the earthquake occurs, um, many of the gas mains um, break, um, fires start in these buildings due to electricity or gas and so on um, that are mixed together and you have a resultant fire. And because people are trapped and can't get out of these buildings relatively quickly, they can't evacuate uh, effectively, then they end up uh, uh, being killed by the burns themselves. And actually we can't really um, underestimate the, um, the extent of fires especially when we're talking about earthquakes that occur in the, this modern age where we have these kinds of uh, uh, gas uh, mains and, and gas lines going across the city. We also have a lot of electricity. So we saw this in the Kobe earthquake in Japan um, uh, a couple of decades ago. In addition, also we saw very severe fire in the, the uh, uh, San Francisco, California earthquake uh, at the turn of the 20th century where uh, many people in San Francisco actually um, lost their homes due to fire that had uh, these homes had already um, been through the earthquake, not destroyed, but fire was then a big issue in San Francisco afterwards. So we have to think in terms of a, a more broad palette of injuries when we're talking about these health impacts of earthquakes.
And then now the, well, let's talk about these delayed effects of earthquakes because this is one of the things if you survive the initial impact, we have to think in terms of these other kinds of things that are a little bit more unusual. And so we wanna talk more about those as well. And I, for you medical personnel out there as well, you know, bringing these to your attention if you're not already aware of these and those folks in public health and other areas of emergency management that may need to know a little bit more about this. So one of the delayed effects of course is dehydration. So as I mentioned uh, just a couple of slides ago, you know, if you're uh, going 24 hours without water, of course, uh, we know that, you know, you start becoming very dehydrated after a few hours. Um, but 24 hours, and then you start talking about 36 hours without water, uh, even more, 72 hours and so on, that's a long time. Most people need water and can't uh, on a daily basis and can't go more than three days. It's very rare that you see people live beyond three days. The fourth day, the fifth day, it's very, very unusual for people to survive without water. But if they're trapped, can't get to water, people can't get to them to give them adequate hydration, um, then they can die simply from the dehydration effects. We also see people die from environmental exposure. So they may be um, either trapped in an area where the sun's beating down on them, uh, there's no shade, um, here they are dehydrated as well, and now you have uh, sunburn and, and heat exposure, you have heat illness and heat stroke and things like that that can occur. So environmental exposure can occur in these hot climates. But we can also have environmental exposure occur in uh, cold climates as well. So, you know, uh, unfortunately these earthquakes can occur during the winter time in some of these areas and you have people that are in areas of, you know, less than 80, uh, 70, 60, 50, 40 degrees and so on. You know, it doesn't take 30 degree weather or 40 degree weather for people to actually drop their body temperature low enough to where they start having problems. A person can die in 80 degree water if that water is actually drawing the heat away from them. So for example, if we're lying on a, on a cold floor and that uh, floor is uh, drawing the temperature away at 50 or 60 degrees, we wouldn't normally think that's dangerous. But because our body needs the uh, temperature in the 90s and it stops, starts dropping below that, it doesn't take much, um, much, uh, get much below that before we start actually start seeing the heart and other irregularities uh, 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 flare up um, in these particular events. So environmental exposure, very key uh, illness when we're talking about the health impacts that are delayed in these earthquakes and big, big issue with that. Now there's another syndrome, there's another type of, of injury that you may have heard some, some stories about um, and I want to share with you now and point this out as well. There's a syndrome called crush syndrome that occurs um, with these earthquakes and, and actually it's something that a couple of times has caught uh, different societies off guard with this that, because of this phenomenon. So have you ever heard the story about the person that maybe, uh, in, you know, entrapped in something heavy that's uh, caught them, whether it's a, a car or a, a, a another structure that's fallen on them and they're talking and they're okay, and then they release that person, they raise up whatever it is off of that person uh, with a car or whatever the debris is that's uh, holding that person down that, that, that's crushed them, and when they release them up, that person takes a few breaths and dies. So here they were talking just fine. Sometimes they get the family members there and then they release that and then all of a sudden, within 30 seconds, 60 seconds, we lose that person. Well, one of that, one we can attribute to that phenomenon is actually called crush syndrome. What ends up happening is actually the large muscles of our body, especially when we're talking about our legs and our, and our, our, our thighs, you know, very large muscles. Those muscles, normally inside the muscle cell, there are chemicals that stay inside and don't get in the bloodstream. So inside the cell, blood uh, goes outside the cell and doesn't spill these chemicals that are inside the muscle. But when a crush occurs, that crush releases those chemicals that are inside the muscle cell and that seeps into the bloodstream. And there are two particularly poisonous effects of that uh, chemical that's inside the muscle leaking out. So one of them in particular, um, it's, a, it's a myoglobin. It's a, a large molecule that ends up getting into the bloodstream. You don't have to remember the, the name of it, of course. But what ends up happening is, is that gets carried by the bloodstream and then it goes to the kidneys. And when it gets to the kidneys, in you know, sort of a, a general description of it, it kind of clogs the kidneys. And when it does so, it damages the kidneys and now we have kidney failure. So most people don't think of earthquakes and kidney failure. But there have been earthquakes example where this has occurred in such large numbers that actually the challenge was getting dialysis machines to an earthquake site. And they cer certainly, you know, to get a lot of them to the earthquake site's one challenge, but then you have to get the specialized doctors and nurses that can run these dialysis machines there as well. 
So no, more, most people don't make that association between earthquakes and kidney failure, but we see that in this crush syndrome. And you know, usually that takes a few hours or a few days for that damage to occur in the kidneys. So that's usually not the one that kills people immediately, but there's another chemical that's inside that muscle cell that gets released. And that chemical is called potassium. And so that potassium that's normally inside the muscle cell, once again, seeps out, gets into the bloodstream, and then it gets carried to the heart. And when high levels of potassium hit the heart, the heart stops. And that's what causes these kinds of rapid deaths. So there are ways if we know ahead of time that you know this crush syndrome is, is a phenomenon that can occur, the ambulance people and medical personnel that are at that scene can give people fluids either by IV and so on and do the kinds, a couple of special types of other treatments and medications and so on that can help alleviate some of that problem so that when that debris is picked up off of the person, you don't have this phenomenon occur as, as frequently as it normally is. Now we can't always stop that, but we certainly, with a little bit of advanced notice, can be able to lessen that impact. So that crush syndrome is kind of an odd thing that we don't normally see in, in society, but this one of the things we have to worry about when we're talking about earthquakes. And that's why I went, I went back to school. As an emergency physician, I went back and studied disaster medicine for a couple of years because there's some of these things that are very specific to disasters that we have to understand a little bit better. Another one of those delayed effects from uh, these particular earthquake-related uh, in injuries is wound infection and sepsis. So, you know, most of these we can kind of think through and, and we'd expect that, right? So a wound that hasn't been treated and uh, you can't get into the hospital during that period of time and over the next several days that wound becomes infected. And then sepsis. Sepsis is actually a word, a medical term that describes an overwhelming infection that sort of spreads throughout the body as a result of this localized infection. So many of us have heard of this, of course, where you have an infection arm or leg, and then it becomes overwhelming, spreads through the bloodstream, and sepsis is what people end up dying for that. So it may end up starting off with just a, a, a laceration, then becomes infected, not a big deal to begin with, but because of this infection, then becomes sepsis and becomes life-threatening. So we have to be careful about that also, and that's one of these delayed effects that we see as a result of earthquakes. And now there's another delayed effect as well that I want to share with you because this is important for the responders as well. You really have to take care of yourself when you go to the field and think in terms of reducing your exposure, reducing your risk. We all know when we're responding to these types of disasters, and many of you have a lot of experience in doing this as well, that uh, you know it's a dangerous place to be, right? We're going into austere environments many times. It's unstable. Um, many of environmental exposures there that can really harm us, and actually not just in the short term, but in the long term as well. And one of them in, in earthquakes in particular are smoke and dust. Um, you breathe in this smoke, of course, and you know there's burning buildings and, and burning structures and so on. Some of these things actually, if plastics burn, um, many people don't know that when plastics burn, they give off cyanide. Yeah, if you actually, if you burn a ping pong ball, it gives off cyanide. The inside of your car, the plastic inside of your car, when you burn that, the carbon and the nitrogen in that particular plastic, then combine with oxygen, um, or release oxygen, and we actually have now cyanide as a result of that. So these smokes can actually be very deadly themselves.